So welcome to today's presentation, Trends, Insights, and Discussion, the Amazon Real Estate Strategy, presented by the Industrial Practice Group and hosted by Jim Maneri. There are just a few housekeeping items we'd like to go over before we get started. So that you have the best sound quality, we ask that you join the audio by dialing into the conference bridge and the invite. Do note that this call is being recorded. To ensure that there is no feedback or background noise while the webinar is in session, please manually mute the audio on your Skype window, manually mute your mobile or desk phone, and finally, please remember not to put the call on hold as hold music will disrupt the call. And with that said, I will now turn it over to your host, Jim Maneri. Jim. Uh, hey, thanks, Emily. Um, hi, guys. Uh, I well, you will, you know, we'll jump right in. I mean, there's there's a lot that we could talk about with Amazon. We're not going to touch on uh, on every topic, uh, but we will uh, we'll cover these uh, in a few areas. I'm going to give a, a brief history of Amazon and its success. Obviously, you can't talk about Amazon without e-commerce. Uh, we'll talk about their portfolio and where they've been growing. Uh, the markets that have them as tenants. We'll talk about uh, their tenancy. Uh, and then the last bullet, uh, which will be the largest section, uh, I'm going to reach out to each market and ask you to you know, talk about what's going on in your markets, you know, are there any active deals, uh, who's winning them, what types of those requirements are. Uh, whoever is, is speaking, uh, will their name will appear, and there also will be an on-deck person. So if you're on deck, uh, please take yourself off mute so we can sort of kind of keep moving. Um, I'll pause for questions, but we'll – We've got a bunch of slides, and we're going to try to, uh, you know, get through as, uh, uh, as much of this as possible. Um, but I will pause for, uh, you know, for questions. Uh, bear with me one second while I find. Sorry, technical questions. There we go. All right. So, uh, the Amazon story. Uh, it's, you know, founded in 1994, you know, as an online bookseller. You know, Bezos originally wanted to, you know, name the company uh, Relentless. Obviously, was talked out of that. Uh, uh, and uh, we know it as Amazon today. You can actually still go, uh, if you enter relentless.com, uh, it still is a URL, and it will take you to the, uh, to, to the Amazon website. Uh, the original logo is on the left. That is meant to depi depict uh, the Amazon River. Obviously, the contemporary one is on the right. You know, most people recognize the smile. Uh, some don't recognize that if that's actually an arrow that points from A to Z, you know, depicting that you can you know, buy whatever you want you know, from the company. Uh, their first sale uh, actually happened in July of 1995. Uh, by the end of 96, you know, they had nearly 16 million in sales. Uh, they went public on NASDAQ in 97, you know, where, uh, when they raised $54 million. Uh, sales by the, uh, 1999 were $1.6 billion. Uh, and then in 2000, uh, partly after the dot-com bubble burst, uh, they recorded a $1.2 billion loss in the year 2000. Uh, company share price obviously would have hit an all-time low that was rumored to uh, be going bankrupt, uh, and you know they went through a massive, uh, you know, restructuring of the company. Uh, they finally were able to, uh, you know, restructure uh, and recorded their first profit uh, in 2001. Uh, uh, they, uh, uh, they launched the you know, free shipping in 2002 for an annual fee. Uh, they actually lowered the price and gave a two-day delivery guarantee in, uh, in 2005, and that was the launch of Amazon Prime. Uh, that's a really important inflection point, you know, for the company because uh, they uh, did not know that they were going to be as successful with Prime, and you'll see a slide later that shows how that took off. Uh, and that, uh, you know, improved, uh, you know, service level as well as the removal of people ordering, you know, three or four things in, in one bundle, now ordering them all individually. 
uh, created incredible challenges for them and, and, and drove you know, the expansion and a sort of a reorganizing of, uh, of their supply chain. Uh, they, uh, uh, in 2009, or uh, 2011, they issued that first national you know, RFP. If you guys remember, that was you know, 34 markets or 34 buildings. Uh, they did the same in 2013. Uh, along the way, in 2012, uh, they bought uh, you know, Kiva Systems, and that was largely uh, in reaction to this incredible success they were having with Amazon Prime, the need to expand, the need to have more workers, recognizing this was going to be a problem uh, longer term. Uh, and 2017, obviously, was a big year. They acquired Whole Foods. They announced the launch of uh, Amazon Prime Air. They located it to uh, northern Kentucky, greater Cincinnati. Uh, and they began the search for a second HQ for which uh, Philly is still in the running. Uh, a couple of quick sort of financial review. I mean, I, um, you'll see I'm you know, highlighting when. Ooh, hold on. Uh, uh, the top bar is, is obviously the revenue. Uh, bottom bar is profitability, you know, the scale of which uh, doesn't really reflect the fact that they made $3 billion last year, uh, but, uh, you know, but they did. Um, and again, their first year profitability was, uh, was 2001. Uh, if you look at their share price, you know, it's that old iconic story. If you'd invested, uh, 5,000 bucks in 97, it'd be worth over a million uh, to today. Uh, that $934 share price was, you know, almost a year ago. Uh, it was uh, over 1,400 bucks, you know, sometime last week. I don't know where it is, uh, it is today. Uh, now, we, you know, we, uh, you know, we all sort of know of Amazon as, you know, moving really quickly to launch new concepts. Uh, you know, their boldness is obviously a part of, uh, you know, their success formula. Uh, but, you know, unknown to most are a number of, uh, you know, of their failures, which I listed a few of them, uh, you know, here. Uh, failures only in the sense that they weren't profitable doesn't mean that they didn't learn something from these. I um, mean, Askville was a question and answer site. Uh, modeled around Yahoo, although I don't remember asking Yahoo, you know, questions. Uh, maybe that's why it didn't go so well. Uh, uh, Amazon actually launched Blockview in 2006, uh, a year before, you know, Google, uh, you know, launched its Street View, uh, but they couldn't figure out how to make money from it. They also had WebPay that was similar to Venmo. They had something called uh, Amazon Analyst that uh, was a marketplace. Uh, separate from their current marketplace for really high-end consumer products. Uh, Amazon Local was something similar to, uh, to Groupon. Uh, Amazon Test Drive was a way to try out uh, an app before actually buying it. Uh, Local Register was a credit card processing software similar to Square. Wallet was meant to compete with PayPal. Uh, but their biggest failure, you know, which you know, uh, at least I remember, was uh, the Fire Phone, the Amazon Fire Phone, which... Uh, uh, never got any traction. They tried to give it away. Uh, 99 cents, you could buy an Amazon Fire Phone at the time, but uh, uh, you know they couldn't make any progress against uh, uh, iPhone, so they abandoned it within six months of uh, of launching it. All right, so can't talk about Amazon without talking about e-commerce. Uh, 2017. Uh, they had 40, almost 44 percent of uh, you know e-commerce uh, you know sales uh, for the entire U.S. Uh, and about four percent of all retail sales. Uh, pundits are predicting that Amazon you know should have more than 50 percent of e-commerce by 2019. You can see that the next closest uh, you know competitors are are way way down. Um, even though uh, you know uh, you know we see their names in. Uh, uh, in the paper and in the press, you know, there's still a, you know, small fraction of what, uh, what Amazon is doing. And the reason, you know, everyone expects Amazon to, to continue to do well, this is a graph of uh, retail sales in general, which are, of course, expected to grow, and then uh, the percentage of those retail sales that will go to e-commerce. And we're still, you know, below the 13 percent uh, going into 17. You know, so you have a growing retail with a growing percentage of that that is e-commerce and then a growing, growing percentage of e-commerce that is Amazon. You know, so, uh, you know, no surprise, Amazon continues to, uh, uh, to grow. Um, 
I wanted to show you this slide because I mentioned to you that Amazon Prime was uh, a sort of an inflection point for the company. Um, uh, in 2000, you know, it was launched in 2005. In 2009, there were only 5 million uh, Amazon Prime members. In 2011, there were 9 million. Uh, and you know, in September of 17, there were 90 million. Um, the, the reason that this is even more significant than it might appear is that uh, when somebody switches from non-prime to prime, uh, historically they double what they buy, and that that amount goes up by you know 40% every year for the first few years that uh, they become prime members. Uh, Amazon continues to add you know content to that membership uh, as well as functionality with Echo and live streaming. Uh, you know, so, you know, Prime is expected to continue to drive, you know, just a, a, a lot of, uh, of their growth. Um, and, uh, you know, just think of between, uh, you know, January of 17 and September, they added, you know, 5 million new members, which was, uh, you know, what they had in the first two years of, of actually having Amazon Prime. And again, the challenge for Prime is that it's a higher service level expectation, lots more customers, um, and, you know, their growth came because they didn't have a footprint that was able to provide, uh, you know, that level of service at that volume uh, to, uh, uh, yeah, on a cost-effective basis. Sorry, I've lost the arrow again. Bear with me one second. There we go. Um, I grabbed this slide from um, uh, a Deutsche Bank presentation. Uh, uh, all of Amazon's efforts to date, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it uh, later, are, are, it were, are were initially about fulfillment uh, and you know the you know delivering products you know very quickly uh, you know, to customers. You know, they have in the last five or so years started turning to their overall supply chain um, and taking uh, segments that were the most expensive. That's part of what is you know. Uh, drove uh, a new product type, which is their outbound sortation facility, which we have one of those. Uh, it facilitates, uh, you know, zone skipping, uh, you know, which you know cuts a big cost of the supply chain out of it. Um, so the expectation is that Amazon will continue to grab sections of their supply chain, uh, uh, and that the not the too distant future, uh, you know, products will show up on Amazon. Uh, ships into ports that are drayed by driverless Amazon trucks, taken to fulfillment centers by those same uh, type trucks, uh, fully automated warehouses uh, will fill orders, uh, and then that will go out uh, uh, you know, either through Amazon Prime Air or through the, the zone skipping uh, and delivered uh, you know, using you know, Uber Flex or actual you know, Amazon drivers. Um, and that those efficiencies will continue to you know, provide uh, sort of uh, uh, you know, escalating you know, savings and then uh, by extension growth for their uh, uh, their revenues. All right, so let's talk about what Amazon has as a well. Let me just pause for a second. Anybody have questions at at, at this point before I change sections to the Amazon portfolio? Okay. Um, so. Amazon portfolio, they have, they sort of have six building types now. They started with fulfillment centers, and that's still the workhorse of, um, uh, you know, their supply chain. Uh, uh, LPT uh, has, you know, four of these types. We have fulfillment centers, uh, we have inbound and outbound sortation uh, centers, and we have uh, a delivery center, you know, down in Richmond. Uh, the workhorse of the Amazon supply chain is the fulfillment center. Uh, which are categorized as you see there's, there's sortable ones, uh, you know, which have the most SKUs and require, you know, the you know, 4,500, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, workers, you know, per building. There's non-sort, which handle, you know, bulky items like kayaks and picnic tables. Uh, and then there are other ones that uh, uh, are dedicated to, uh, to return centers. Uh, the pantry and fresh, you know, food FCs, you know, didn't start arriving until 2013. They sort of average around 150K. We don't have any of those. Um, uh, the ones that handle fresh food are, of course, refrigerated. Uh, the pantry is, uh, uh, is you know, handling, uh, you know, non-perishables. Uh, Prime uh, Now buildings, you know, started coming out in 2014. Uh, they are smaller. They're obviously closer into population centers. They have a limited number of SKUs. Uh, but they do offer same-day, uh, you know, delivery. Uh, 
inbound sortation uh, you know, centers you know, sort of are in the 400,000 square foot uh, you know, range. Um, and these are used, you know, they, they are primarily cross-docked. Uh, the buildings receive product from manufacturers, you know, frequently from overseas and distributors. Uh, then they distribute, you know, they break down the goods and then distribute them to fulfillment centers. Now the, out, uh, the outbound sortation centers, and we have one of these, um, allow Amazon to zone skip. Uh, you know, so, uh, uh, you know, which means that they, they skip the most expensive segment that UPS, FedEx, or the uh, United States Postal Service would charge them. Um, and we'll talk about that in, the, in a minute as well. Uh, outbound sortation uh, receives boxes from fulfillment centers uh, uh, that are uh, ready for, uh, you know, they've already been boxed, you know, for the Menaries or the Smiths. Uh, they arrive sorted by uh, zip codes uh, uh, and, uh, you know, are handed off to the Postal Service, you know, or FedEx or UPS at this stage in the distribution uh, uh, or in the supply chain, uh, and they skip the most costly part of it. Um, and then there are delivery stations that average, you know, sort of 50k square feet. We have the, that's what we have down in Richmond, um, and this basically provides, you know, last mile delivery service, frequently using, uh, you know, Uber Flex or Amazon Flex. But you can see the size of their portfolio in total, right? In the U.S., uh, uh, you know, there's uh, 329 buildings, 122 million square feet, and another 30 million on the way, you know. Worldwide, 190 million square feet, with you know, with 34 million on the way. I mean, it's just a a vast portfolio, you know, assembled, uh, you know, very quickly. And we'll, I'll show you that in a second. Um, so this is just showing you, and I, I couldn't focus, you know, for time's sake, on all of the building types. Um, so I'm sort of focusing on the the workhorse uh, aspect of it. Uh, and so I'm just I'm just going to talk about the fulfillment centers, just from an analysis of sort of where the growth has been. It's also you know, the product that has the most, uh, uh, you know, the greatest square footage. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, the initial rollout of Amazon's warehouses, you know, basically followed a sales tax avoidance strategy. You know, so they were staying out of California. They were staying out of New Jersey. Or they were staying out of Illinois. Uh, their, uh, their first, you know, warehouse in 1997 was in Delaware. Uh, and uh, they also put two in Kentucky. By 2005, the portfolio size uh, was at 5 million square feet, uh, primarily in Kentucky, but they also uh, had moved into Delaware and Pennsylvania. 2010, they were up to 14 million square feet, uh, expanding into Nevada and Arizona that were uh, servicing uh, California. Uh, they were in New Hampshire, which was servicing uh, uh, Boston. Uh, they were also in, uh, in Indiana, which was uh, helping to service uh, the Chicago market. Uh, but they were not into New Jersey, they weren't in California or Illinois, and they didn't get into any of those markets until 2012, you know, when they fully abandoned their efforts to, uh, to stop, uh, you know, paying sales tax. Uh, all right, so you can see um, here a map of where they are, which is basically, you know, everywhere. Um, and they have over 100 million square feet of uh, these fulfillment centers, uh, but you know, uh, almost 50% of them are sort of in four quadrants. You know, you know, PA New Jersey has almost 15 million square feet. Texas has uh, has 10 million. Uh, Kentucky, Indiana, you know, Ohio. You know, these, these buildings are all within an hour of each other. Uh, Kentucky is really greater Cincinnati, you know, which is Ohio um, has you know almost 17 million square feet. You know, California obviously with uh, uh, you know, a big number at, at 16 million. You know, so even with that large portfolio spread out, uh, you know, half of it is in four sort of major, uh, uh, you know, sort of I guess large submarkets. Um, what I wanted to do, um, you said you, you uh, sort of saw the scale that um, uh, that they had, and I don't know if you noticed that uh, you know they were adding 20 million square feet every year for sort of the last three or four years. Um, uh, is, you know, to then look quickly at, you know, well, where is it, you know, where is it going and who's getting those deals? You know, so with some Cushman and CBRE data, um, I uh, assembled sort of a list for 2016, 2017 of all deals over 250,000 square feet uh, for, you know, those two years. Um, uh, and 
and uh, there's a big chunk of them that are confidential, um, so it actually doesn't show everything. Um, and I know a bunch of them are Amazon deals because there's two that are missing in Columbus, but it sort of gives you a sense of, of Amazon scale uh, and then you know who they're doing the deals with. Um, so the uh, the total number of deals over two hundred you know over two hundred fifty thousand square feet in the entire U.S. for sixteen and seventeen were six hundred sixty seven three hundred fifty one million square feet. Amazon had at least you know fifty plus of them for thirty nine million square feet, uh, and it's, it's slightly more than that I know because there's ones that are in the co the confidential category. Uh, UPS was a distant second uh, with uh, uh, you know, just under uh, you know 10 million square feet, and it drops off pretty precipitously after that. I did think it was interesting that you know still the top 10 accounted for uh, you know 30 percent of the total. But this is for the entire U.S. Uh, if you look at just Liberty Markets, Amazon still uh, you know this is just for you know the last two years, 35 deals, 26 million square feet. They're 10 percent of of all new uh, leases signed. Uh, when I say new, most of these are actually, you know, replacement or new buildings, but there are some renewals that are in there. Um, so, uh, you know, where are they happening? Um, you know, no surprise here. Uh, you know, big numbers, you know, Southern California, Dallas, Chicago, PA, New Jersey, you know, sort of had the highest volume. Uh, there are a couple of cities in here that we are not in, uh, St. Louis, you know, Kansas City. Um, here's the same. Uh, uh, there's the total number of deals for Amazon. Um, here's the same view uh, just for Liberty Markets. Um, and again, no surprise, uh, you know, SoCal, Dallas, Chicago, uh, Philly, PA, New Jersey, you know, being uh, uh, the biggest, uh, uh, you know, uh, having the biggest volume from Amazon. Uh, like I said, there's two for about 2 million square feet from Columbus that are missing from this. Um, so, uh, Next question is, um, who did they lease them from? Uh, Hillwood Duke Prolo just got the lion's share of them. Uh, there's a chunk of uh, developers that got uh, multiple leases. USAA is really a proxy for Seafreed uh, because they're the takeout uh, for, uh, for Seafreed on development. And there are a bunch of companies, including Liberty, that got one. Uh, you know, deal, uh, and this is you know, you know total U.S. Um, similar to before, I'm just filtering out uh, the non-Liberty markets. So just the Liberty markets, uh, you know, the big you know winners uh, are um, uh, you know Duke is in the number one spot. Uh, sort of trails off from there, and there are a bunch of folks, you know, us included, that uh, are in the one deal category. Uh, the bulk of Dukes were in the Central Midwest, where we don't have. You know any new product to offer, uh, and Duke has done a couple of uh, of build the suits for them. Uh, I, I I'm going to talk briefly about a conversation I had with Rick Dietrich, but I did ask the question of who are the preferred developers for Hillwood. Uh, Duke Realty, uh, Hillwood, and Seafried really are the primary three, uh, with Hillwood and Seafried you know, being a little bit more, uh, uh, I guess, popular or more common. Um, and that's because they've agreed, all three of these have agreed to work in a, uh, an Amazon structure, whereas they want to go in, control or identify the site, uh, have a developer go in and agree to work on a, you know, an open book, uh, you know, basis uh, with a, you know, sort of narrow spread. Uh, the risk of cap rates moving against you is yours, uh, but they want to share in the upside. Uh, if it turns out to be highly profitable, uh, Liberty has chosen not to do that. Uh, you know, our deals have always been on sites that we controlled that they liked, or, or buildings that uh, you know we own uh, and that they wanted to uh, you know to occupy. Uh, Prologis has taken the same approach that uh, that we have. Uh, Prologis is their largest landowner and uh, or landlord, and it's uh, Prologis' largest tenant. Uh, they're obviously like to do business with them, but won't you know live under that uh, you know with that structure. Uh, so here's the, the the org chart of of Amazon. I mean, that that uh, on the corporate real estate state on the corporate real estate side, uh, Clark Levy and you know Brandt are the 
uh, or I'm sorry, Clark and Levy are the top guys. Uh, Brant and Rick Dietrich uh, both handle transactions. Uh, I've always felt like Rick was senior to Craig, but they have similar responsibilities. Rick is who, uh, who we know uh, the best. Rick was recently asked to spend uh, 12 months looking for ways to, uh, to save money, and uh, uh, I'll talk to you about that in a second. Uh, uh, within Amazon, uh, there used to be a group of brokers that worked for Cushman or hung their, their license with Cushman, but did all their transactional work. Uh, that was John Hansen, who sort of headed it up, uh, and then there was uh, uh, Todd Meldahl, Zach Bodie, Bree Jensen, and Mandy Moda, all of whom we have met. Uh, John and Todd went off and started their own brokerage firm, uh, working exclusively for Amazon, but the expectation is that, that KBS brokerage will start opening up offices in the sort of medium term. Uh, they'll have a you know, baseline of business coming from Amazon, uh, but they will be free to you know, pursue you know, additional work as well. Hey, Jim. Yeah. Can you just go back one? Mm-hmm. When you say worldwide operations, direct worldwide real estate, these are all on the logistics side, right? One There's of, other real estate people for, like, their data centers and their office space. and. Uh, yeah, I, I believe the, that Dave, uh, and I honestly can't remember because I haven't um, – I haven't met either one of them. But one of them sits on top of all of real estate. I just can't remember which one. Yeah. One okay. of the, one of these is on. You know, it was the name that was given to us that was looking. It was that was part of the HQ. Yep. Yep. Uh, you know, search. Yep. Okay. Um, and that there are people that specialize in in different product types. Correct. Uh, uh, and I know there is a separate web services guy. Okay. Uh, all right, just for fun, we created some bobbleheads from pictures that we had taken from uh, from football games, but they, you know, they are real pictures that we took uh, at various events, uh, you know, with them. Uh, uh, and you know, briefly, I wanted to just I, just, I created a slide because I didn't want to lose track of the of the points. Uh, I'm going to talk for a second about a conversation I had with Rick. Michael Alderman is then going to share uh, sort of a download on a presentation that he heard. Uh, up in the Lehigh Valley, um, and then we'll move to uh, uh, our portfolio with them, and then hearing from uh, you know, from the field. Uh, but when I talked to Rick, telling him that we were going to do this, you know, he brought up two things. I mean, he, he mentioned that Amazon Prime was way more successful than they expected, which is what created this incredible you know demand and why they you know uh, you know had those RFPs back in 11 and then 13, and they've basically been adding you know close to 20 million square feet ever since. Uh, uh, and so, you know, they build out all of this infrastructure to provide the level of service, and now there's a, you know, a strong pivot to figure out how to provide things, uh, you know, more cost effectively. Um, so the outbound, you know, sortation facility, you know, was an answer to that. You know, so all this, uh, uh, it, when when Prime was really successful, it was 35% more expen- more expensive to fulfill it than a non-Prime order, um, because you know, you know, the Maneris would order, uh, 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 you know, shaving cream and then, oh yeah, let me, you know, let me order filters for the air conditioner and then, you know, dog food. And it would come in three different packages. I wasn't, cause like you know, shipping was free. I wasn't aggregating them. And then of course it had to be delivered in two days. So they needed to figure out a way to, uh, to cut costs because they were, you know, in the old days they would have, you know, given it to UPS who would have taken it from, you know, the fulfillment center all the way to my door. Um, and, you know, that was just too expensive. So uh, they created these outbound sortation facilities, which, you know, some people call it zone skipping. Others call it uh, postal injection, you know, where, uh, you know, you provide, you know, that, you know, that service, you know, internally, you know, don't pay UPS, FedEx to do it. And they, you know, they get the, uh, you ask them to do the, uh, you know, sort of the less expensive piece. Uh, but, you know, that's just, you know, an example of it. Uh, and he told the story that he actually spent a day and a half in Oklahoma at Nucor Steel uh, because he was trying to figure out, given the, you know, 20 million square feet a year of warehouses, could he uh, provide Nucor with a schedule that they could 
produce it in a more efficient way and the savings could be passed on to uh, the projects. And because, you know, this would be used for, uh, you know, the, the structure where the, the developer has agreed to a, you know, a spread on cost, you know, any cost savings that he can come up with, um, you know, they stick in their pocket. Uh, the answer, by the way, was there probably wouldn't be, you know, you know much savings from it. Uh, and the other question, you know, answer unrelated to Amazon, but was that the, the tariff that's getting charged, uh, would that allow, you know, like, you know, on steel, would Nucor be hiring more people? Um, and at least the local guy said that, uh, you know, they, they had so much capacity in their system that they didn't need to hire anybody else, but the tariff would allow them to uh, charge more, which, you know, I thought was interesting. Um, uh, the other piece, you know, again, with all of this growth was a push for innovation and robotics uh, and efficiencies within the warehouses. You know, Rick's, you know, quote to me was, you know, you probably assume Amazon is investing heavily into, you know, R&D and robotics and sorting. Um, and whatever number you can imagine, it's a lot more than that. Um, and the way he explained it was that um, they need a lot more capacity uh, around the big, you know, the, the, their, you know their major centers. Uh, but they're already employing you know, like 25,000 people in central and north Jersey and 20,000 people in Pennsylvania. Um, and, uh, you know, they're worried about, um, you know, being able to hire more people. So they're pushing really hard for uh, the efficiency. Um, unsolicited, he was quick to point out that they need so much more capacity, like he thinks they need to double in the, ne you know, uh, in the next 10 years, um, that he does not believe any of these buildings will become obsolete because uh, the efficiency, you know, the, the, the robotics and the uh, innovation will allow them just to be more efficient uh, and they just won't need quite as many more buildings, which they really don't want to build anyway. Uh, but the, the issue on labor, which is pushing innovation, um, is also uh, pushing them to look into secondary and tertiary markets, uh, which you know, sounds sort of the opposite, but basically they, they think they have such efficiency in their supply chain that if they put something in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, that will absorb pressure out of the, uh, you know, Northern Kentucky uh, fulfillment center um, and will actually provide innovation, not make them have to hire people in, uh, in Northern Kentucky, but instead in Cleveland where there's a better workforce. You know, so they're, they're creating capacity at their, you know, primary centers in those four markets that I talked about by actually going to secondary centers and even tertiary ones. Um, and that's, uh, 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 you know, that has been in some of their recent RFPs, you know, looking for, you know, Syracuse and Cleveland and Dayton and uh, uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, Burlington, Vermont, uh, uh, New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, uh, the other thing that, uh, that he mentioned was they are, they do have a new fulfillment, fulfillment center prototype, uh, which uh, will have three layers of mezzanine. Uh, they had two before, you know, so three levels where we're working. Now there'll be three mezzanines, so four levels. Uh, and that is in anticipation of, you know, providing, you know, considerable more, you know, uh, uh, you know innovation and robotics, uh, you know, to that building. And, and hey, Jim. Be, and they'll be like 50 feet uh, clear as well. Oh, huh. that, that was my question. So they're looking for taller buildings to put three levels in. Uh, correct. So that would be the fulfillment center of the future. Correct. Yep. Uh, a little bit smaller. They were saying that it would be, uh, although, and I didn't ask the question, you know, because he said they would be under 700,000 square feet. Was that the footprint? And therefore, there's three levels at, you know, 600,000 feet? Or was that with all four levels? And I'm guessing mm -hmm. the answer is the former. You know, it's a 600,000 square foot footprint, 50 feet tall with, you know, three, three layers of, of mezzanine. Mm -hmm. um, all right, let me pivot to to Michael Alderman. Uh, Mike, you don't have you don't have the name of the guy that you heard present. Yeah. Uh, yeah so uh, uh, fill that Jim, in and tell me when to change slides. Jim, it's Maz. Right, okay. right before you jump off, jump to Mike. So we've been hearing from various people in northern New Jersey that Amazon is pushing their warehouses further away from the infill markets even, you know, to the point of, you know, rural type of 
destinations because of the cost. Did your conversation with Dietrich have any any uh, slant of that in it at all? Uh, yes. Yeah, that was the where I was saying that although they continue to grow in their sort of core markets, right. uh, they are specifically pivoting to secondary and even tertiary markets, yeah. you know, the, the Dayton's of right. the world, uh, just for that reason. Cheaper labor, you know, more available la labor, and that their supply chain now is efficient enough where, you know, Dayton can actually create some capacity in their core market. And, okay, so, but a little piece of humor, um, that build the suit that was their first in Delaware was going to be 100% um, books in there, <laughs> which is odd, right? The other, the other thing part about it is what they were, there was their lack of a balance sheet um, scared the hell out of us. I remember getting George involved with it, and we decided not to uh, try and try and compete on that thing because of their balance sheet. And you know, interesting what what's happened to this whole thing. Yeah, and they and we we actually looked at and and competed for the million square footer that they put down in Middletown in the 2011 RFP. Uh, we weren't worried about their balance sheet, but we were worried about you know what the exit yield would be. Mm -hmm. right, hey Michael? Jim, Jim. Oh, yes, sorry. Jim Massey, sorry. I know we want to get going here, but um, given that we were not in the Seafree Hillwood Duke bucket. From you know, and getting the basically the, the the preview for these deals before anybody sees them, and, and then frankly, I think they're sending Seafried out almost exclusively in some markets without any competition. I mean, are, are there is there a way for us to understand if if that's not going to work for a model? And I know we've studied it several ways, and for obvious reasons, it may not work. Is there a way for us? Do you think to to get more insight on these secondary markets and the next wave of? A, existing markets, because like, for example, Charlotte, they've taken down three and a half million feet in about 24 months. And I would put that clearly in the, in the secondary bucket for markets. And are there, is there a way to get ahead of that? Um, these, if, if we're not going to get the, the juicy million square footers in your mind, is, is there a strategy uh, that we can pursue? Yeah, look, I mean, if we just, it, it, uh, if those were done using the Amazon model, um, meaning that you know they they go in and you know identify a few sites that might work, they don't really do any due diligence. They just you know pick out sites that that you know, that could work. They might sometimes send in Seafried in advance to do a little bit of you know scratching of the surface. Um, uh, if they're those types of deals, you know, then we'd have to change our view of you know, competing for them. I mean, we, I mean Rick has said you know, he likes Liberty, he likes the people that he's interacted with, you know, the markets that uh, that they are in. Uh, and we asked him the question, you know, three years ago. Um, and, and, you know, these were here, his words, you know, of, you know, you got to sort of, you know, play the ball that they want us to play. Uh, and, you know, one of them was finding a capital partner to, to, so that we could be more aggressive from a pricing perspective. And, um, you know, we elected not to do that just like Prologis did. Um, Hillwood had the same conversation and, uh, you know, elected to, you know, follow it to, uh, you know, exactly how they want it. And they, they act as a Seafried um, in some markets, you know, as well. Um, so, I, you know, to, if it's the structure that they currently have, we'd have to, uh, you know, review our, you know, our position on that. And uh, uh, it was a tough one to, you know, to swallow. I think, Jim, I think we should review our position in certain situations where we have land that is more problematic for us. So like Goodyear, uh, the Suffolk land, MB Rogers. I mean, I think there's some land tracks that we have that we should take a more aggressive approach uh, with yeah, these opportunities. Uh, um, I, I don't disagree with being more aggressive with land that we don't want. By the way, we've, we've put all those, those pieces of land in front of them. Yeah. Uh, but that's not their model, right? I mean, their model is, hey, we're going to find the site. Yep. Uh, and then we're going to bring you in, and it'll be, you know, you tell me how many basis points are, uh, above, you know, a certain treasury you, you need to be. That's the constant we use to determine my rent. Uh, if cap rates go against you, you know, that's too bad. Uh, if you make money on selling it, you know, we share on the upside. 
Yeah. Um, but uh, but where it, we where we own land, um, you know, we just put it in front of them and try to give them an aggressive deal. Yeah. Hey, the the other thing. So we saw this down in South Georgia. Um, they partnered with Seafried. It's sort of like Matthew was talking about. No one knew about it in the market, but the county threw in the land for free. Yeah. So I think we need to realize that you know these municipalities are out in not not Charlotte. I mean, I'm talking Podunk, Macon, Georgia. They'll throw in land for free just to get the jobs, and so it'd be tough for us unless we're willing to throw in stuff for free and give give incentives. If we have challenging land, I, I don't know. We might still be running up against a, a tough competitor in the. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say in Philadelphia, you know, we heard that they had a requirement, uh, uh, or they shared with us that they had a requirement, and we had a couple of, of I think, sites that we uh, shared with them, and then we're going to present a site that we didn't control that was up in the Northeast, and they said, oh, yeah, we already know about that, we're already engaged on, you know, so that, you know, uh, I, I'm, sure, I'm not sure who controlled it, but uh, they frequently have gone into, uh, you know, EDAs. Uh, and municipalities to find out, you know, what sites they'd be interested yep, in, or yep, be interested yep. in, in developing. Yeah. Hey, uh, hey, Jim. Um, and I mean, this is the, this last five minutes is a good conversation that maybe we could continue when we're together in June, so, you know, face to face and everything. Mm -hmm. um, and Massey, I don't mean to pick on the words you selected, but you talked about the juicy deals that I forget what you said. Siegfried gets her. Mm -hmm. That's really the question. Are they juicy? <laughs> right. Um, you know, and uh, uh, but there's our experience today, I think everybody would agree, is the degree we land an Amazon deal, we land it because we have a site and a fundamentally a building that fits into their pattern of what they want, and they're going to take it from us. Um, you know, we've we've looked, I guess, Jim, twice or three times at their RFPs. And, you know, they REITs tend not to do them because they're so thin, right? And they're flip, you know, they want a piece of your action. And, mm -hmm. But it's worth, yeah. I mean, I'm happy to continue our conversation, but. Yeah. but uh, our experience. Do that only so we can, we can try to get this in within, within the hour. Uh, yeah, Michael, that's the only reason I was, yeah. And, and yeah, and we'll, um, we will still go back around, uh, you know, the markets to, to, which maybe we can pick up that thread then. So, uh, but Michael, you want to talk about this session that you sat in on? Yeah, I'll I'll be quick as it's more academic, but it, I think it is uh, it's uh, enlightening in terms of some business in the future. Uh, I, many of you may have made the same observation as me that that Amazon's pretty secretive about how they run the supply chain. They tend not to be presenters at things like uh, CSC and P and work. Uh, Lehigh University here in my backyard does a twice a year symposium, and, and just sort of by odd luck. Uh, a gentleman named Ed Feitzinger, F-E-I-T-Z-I-N-G-R, who's the vice president of Amazon Global Logistics, uh, was the keynote speaker uh, last week. And I thought, all right, I better go to this since this guy's got an hour-long slot and I need the keynote. And sure enough, he spoke and he said that, you know, the only reason he's there uh, is because he's a Lehigh grad and his uh, engineering advisor, uh, you know, asked him to come. He's not allowed to give these speeches. He's not allowed to hand out PowerPoints and or he asked us not to take pictures. But uh, I recorded the presentation on my phone and, and, and took a lot of notes, and there's some valuable stuff to, to share. He's been there almost two years. He used to be CEO of a company called UTI Worldwide, so he's more of the international uh, uh, side of their supply chain, although he adapted the pre presentation to be mostly about North America. His indoctrination at Amazon consisted really of three statements. The first is their mission statement which gets beat into them you know, to be the Earth's most customer-centric company. And then the second and third are quotes from Bezos. The first one is, uh, our customers will be absolutely loyal to us until the very moment they are offered a better experience somewhere else. So that that's uh, an instructive for the supply chain people to get the product inexpensively fast uh, to, uh, to the customers. And then the last, uh, trust is built up when you make a hard promise and you keep it. And they say those are things that Bezos just uh, they beat on. Now, one of the things they they how they envision the company is this thing they call the flywheel, which you have in front of you on the screen, which is growth centered, and it's all about driving traffic to their website, uh, bringing as many sellers as they can into their business through Amazon fulfillment services, giving the biggest selection. They have over 
480 million different items on Amazon, giving the customer the best experience. And part of all that is lowest price and lowest cost structure to to them. That is the, the heuristic that they use to, to really drive the entire business, especially the supply chain group. Uh, Jim, if you could go to uh, go to the next one, please. Um, they, they talk about the, the segmentation of product and how it fits into supply chain. And he gave the example first of tail products, which is the second in this list of items. These are things that are way out on the end of the uh, uh, distribution curve. Like I said, they have 480 million SKUs. Some things that are so odd, like a five pound gummy bear and a can of unicorn meat, things that you can never get in a store, but because the way Amazon works, you can get them on Amazon. That's what drives traffic is by having this incredibly uh, diverse selection of tail products. They can't afford, it'll never make sense to keep these products in tight, close to large metro areas. They're going to be in the sort of the standoff fulfillment core inventory locations, but they, they are going to have them and they're going to continually optimize where they keep them around the country based upon search patterns uh, of Amazon customers. Then head product are, are things that are consumer staples that, that are bought by everybody uh, on a very dependable basis. These are the things that are going into those forward deployed, near in, close urban, new distribution centers, smaller buildings, so that they can be delivered in two hours, you know, uh, like an Amazon, uh, a Prime Now uh, service can provide. And then in between, you have torso products, things that are neither tail or head that, that are uh, spread throughout the, all these different fulfillment centers in terms of where they're kept uh, as, as storage. Uh, but a big part of what they're doing is, is recognizing the slotting of the right product into the right buildings. Um, in there, uh, some themes that were relevant. This is an hour-long presentation. I'm just, I just grabbed some things that I thought were relevant to cost. Uh, Jim mentioned this earlier. Amazon started taking direct control of their supply chain. They bought a thousand tractors from Schneider a few years ago. They now lease 20 airplanes. This 3 million square foot uh, air hub are all examples of Amazon saying, you know what, we can't expect our supply chain partners to size their fixed cost infrastructure to accommodate us during the peak season. Therefore, we need to do it ourselves and also reap the cost benefits of, of having, having done that. There was a whole offshoot conversation on this in terms of how it becomes competitive advantage, how they dominate the market by controlling the postal service, by controlling UPS, by controlling FedEx ground. I can't really, the time doesn't permit us to go into that now, but it's pretty fascinating. Um, there, you know, his saying was che it's cheaper for them to rent and buy airplanes and trucks than to lose customers. It, this is all about growing the business, adding, adding customers and pushing more volume through the system as efficiently as possible. This new generation of fulfillment centers that we're talking about these taller buildings are 20% smaller. And because they're using Kiva more and they're using more mezzanine, they have better storage density. So they're getting more product in a smaller footprint than uh, you know, the older generation. What's best I could tell the fulfillment centers we have are uh, here locally are at least two generations old, but thankfully, you know, they've been updated to, to stay relevant. Um, their future is all about, you know, keeping up with Jeff's demands, but, but you know, things like let's get stuff delivered in an hour or two, uh, ideas that, you know, even five years ago would have been impossible to even think about in North America. Uh, and the way they're doing it is through what they call fast experimentation. They, they, they throw a bunch of ideas on how something in the business can be done in a very out of the box kind of way. They don't limit those much and they just, they authorize uh, groups to grab onto those different ideas of improving processes and go out and experiment and try them in a market. And that's how, uh, you know, San Francisco, for example, was one of the spots for uh, same day delivery. I think it was Tracy, California, San Francisco was the example he gave was the first place. Uh, it took them 111 days uh, to get to same day delivery and they, they were able to do it. And then they rolled it out across the country. Right now, China is where they tend to be trying most urban development things out because uh, uh, the problems, the, the thinking is it's a market they want to get into. So if they can solve the problems there, they get the benefit of more revenue in China. But then also, if it works in China, as difficult as it is to move freight, it'll probably work in other places too. So that's sort of the test uh, laboratory. 
Great. Thanks, Michael. And um, sure. uh, just going to uh, keep us moving. Um, we're going to jump into just a quick discussion about the buildings that we have in our individual markets. Um, uh, Michael, you're on deck again uh, uh, to talk about you know, your fulfillment sure. center uh, buildings. But um, uh, we have seven, if you include uh, the one that uh, they're a customer of XPO in, uh, uh, you know, which, you know, Menlo is providing 3PL services to Amazon, so we've included it here, uh, 3.2 million square feet, uh, four in Lehigh, two in uh, New Jersey, one in Richmond. Uh, they are our largest uh, tenant by revenue, um, and or industrial tenant by revenue and square footage. But when uh, Central PA delivers the XPO building, uh, you know, they'll be pretty close as far as, you know, uh, you know one, two. Michael? Uh, yep. So, uh, actually, Joe Trinkle uh, probably did most of these, these transactions. Uh, they're currently at 705 Boulder and 650 Boulder, which where they operate fulfillment centers. Um, they were tenants of ours locally in smaller buildings at, at uh, 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 the Meadows Business Center, although I couldn't find records of it because it, it predates 2005. But these are uh, fulfillment centers where they're storing core inventory, both uh, the two Brindingsville, um, and they're sortable buildings. As uh, And Lewisbury uh, is a fulfillment center, but there's virtually no conveyance in there. It's people walking around pushing carts. Uh, and as Jim mentioned, uh, the Carlisle building is uh, leased by XPO, but it's operated for Amazon, and it is non-sortable, so it's all the large bulky items. Great, thanks. I'm going to jump from there only because uh, I want to talk about these next three building types. Um, Pete, if you're on, can you talk about your inbound and outbound sortation buildings? Sure. So uh, 309 Cedar, which is in Florence, is an exit six off the New Jersey Turnpike. It's a 613,000 square foot building, and it's considered a resource center. And what they do, the product arrives in bulk and goes to their Amazon robotic sortation locations or they're non-sort, and that's a function of the size of the product. So the product comes from the port or the manufacturers in, in uh, tractor trailers. It's broken down uh, in bins and then shipped right out again. And the, the cool thing about this receive center is uh, product is only supposed to remain in the building for three hours. Uh, they have a they, they uh, spent probably $23 million on conveyor equipment throughout the building. And the other unique thing is, although this building is cross dock, the, material, the product doesn't go across the building. It goes in one end of, at, the, at the front of the building, say at the loading end, and goes out the rear end using the same side of the building. It's just the way that they set up their conveyor system. Uh, the other unique thing about this 613,000 square footer is we have 1,000 car parking. It was one of the reasons why they selected a building. We were able to provide all the additional parking that they needed. Rent start there at 520 with Two and a half percent increases, and they're it's a uh, it's a ten year lease. The other building, Sweetsboro, was one of our first Amazon deals. We did that back in '15. That's an outbound sortation center. As it says, 203,000 square feet. They receive product, uh, break it down by uh, zip code, and then it goes to the to the postal service. So when this building opened up in in November of '15, they needed to get going before the holiday season and they literally had uh, the Postal Service start delivering product. We opened up on Friday. They were delivering product on that following Sunday before uh, right after uh, right before Thanksgiving for product delivery. Same scenario, 10 years. The difference between this one on the, on the inbound sortation, we gave them $5 a foot and this outbound sortation, we actually advertise additional TI so the rent there goes over um, 625 a foot um, because we advertised another close to $13 in TIs for them, and they funded their equipment on the inside. Uh, excellent. Thank you. And then uh, the fourth product type, uh, which is the delivery station, is what we have down in Richmond. Uh, Brian Felton, you on? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, this is their uh, uh, last mile delivery. Uh, this facility was fueled by uh, their two 1.2 million square foot fulfillment centers uh, located uh, just south of Richmond. And um, uh, this building is uh, 
it's a, a 1972 vintage building, uh, typical front load, uh, has rail siding in the back with rail doors, um, has a large truck court area on the front of the building and also on the side, um, which enabled um, Amazon to get the high density parking that they require. They, they were asking for about 100, and, I think it was 136 or 140 parking spaces total. Um, the ceiling height's only 21 foot clear. That wasn't a concern. They don't rack any product here. Uh, what they do is they truck it in at night from the fulfillment centers um, and uh, put it between the drive-in lanes on uh, kind of carts that uh, you'd see in a garden nursery. Um, and uh, those carts are all um, labeled or limited as to how long it takes to deliver all the boxes on that cart. Um, they queue all the drivers. Their drivers are either Uber drivers or Amazon Flex drivers. Uh, they queue them up in lanes in the front of the building, and then uh, when that lane fills up and they're ready, they'll open one of the drive-in doors. Um, they have uh, ramps to the doors so the cars drive in the front. Um, all get in the lines. Uh, once they're all in, they're not allowed to leave their vehicles until all the cars are in, all the cars are stopped, and they're all turned off. Um, and then whistles blow, they get out of their cars, they go over and, and, and grab the product, put it in their cars. Um, when everybody's loaded up again, everyone gets back in the vehicles. When they're signaled, they turn on their cars. Um, the back doors open, which were the rail siding doors. Uh, that they've also ramped, and then they drive straight out the back of the building. Um, you know, some of the 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 big concerns or their hot buttons were the fact that uh, they had to have 24/7 access to the building. Uh, they were concerned about the adjacent tenant and the fact that they didn't want the adjacent tenant um, prohibiting them from from these vehicles and all the cars coming and going uh, in an efficient manner. Uh, and uh, it's worked out real well for them here. Um, I think they're happy, we're very happy with the facility and how everything uh, flows. And then just last year, um, Amazon just opened a 320,000 square foot sortation facility uh, just north of Richmond. So we've, we've seen quite a bit of activity here from them. Oh, that's great, thank you. Um, Brian, Brian tell it, um, a lot of people have asked me this question, but talk about the, um, the ventilation requirements and safety and the rapid slide doors and the ramps and, you know, just the basic changes that you had to make to the building? Yeah, they, 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 I gave them a tenant improvement allowance of $2 a foot. Uh, it was a five-year lease that was signed. And um, they spent well in excess, probably over, over 10 times that amount in this building. Uh, put in big ass fans. Um, I had all new T5 lights. They asked us to remove all those, so we we pulled them all out and we're reusing them in other buildings. They put in LED lighting. Uh, they put roof ventilation in um, for the uh, car exhaust fans. Um, the uh, concrete ramps are the uh, very large, wide prefab concrete ramps. Um, they put in high speed roll up doors uh, with screens on them. Um, it's it, it's a they they pretty much demoed any of the existing office that was in the facility and then designed and built, again, exactly what they wanted. Um, I think at the end of the day, it makes sense for them to have have the facility exactly the way they need it in the most efficient manner. Great, thank you. It was quite a process. It took them about three and a half, four months to build that out. Uh, the lease was signed December of 16, December 1st. The lease commenced December 1st of 16. Um, I don't think they pushed the first piece of product through that building until August of 17. Hey, Jim. Yeah. I know you're going to go through all these people, which is great, and you should do it. I, by the way, I think this is just an excellent presentation. I think it would be great to go through some exercise, not right now because we don't have time, of what things did we do with Amazon that they found extremely helpful in the leasing process or the operational process or whatever, that we could use as good practice when in doing, you know, when we deal with them as a customer, like what, you know, what I mean? I mean, yeah. I think there's some takeaways from all this that could be helpful as a shared knowledge base. Mm -hmm. uh, got it. I'll, I'll make yep. a note. Yep. 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 Um, and then, uh, yeah, we're, you know, we're at the top of the hour, as they say. Uh, but I was going to try to, you know, run around, you know, the markets to, you know, quickly go through what, you know, what it is that you're, you know, seeing, and if you think you don't have a whole lot to offer. Um, you know, we can, you know, we can move on. 
the six questions are at the bottom. You know, Hans Brindley, you're up. Brian Blythe, you're on deck. Do we have Hans? All right, moving on. Brian, play. Yeah, with sorry, us. Jim. <laughs> I was uh, my phone. My phone was frozen. I was trying to get off mute. Uh, yeah, so um, in Houston, they just uh, they have one large fulfillment center that you have seen uh, that we saw on your slide. Um, they moved into that about a little over a year ago. That was 855,000 square feet. Kind of a a standard industrial location in North Houston. Um, they did it with Z, uh, Zfried and USA was a takeout partner, as you mentioned. Um, you know, the deal is probably driven by uh, location. They really didn't get that much in incentives. Uh, they did get a little bit. Then uh, more recently, they've done a, they're in the process of constructing a million square foot building um, with Duke. Again, kind of like everyone described, the, the Seafree deal we heard about and got a little bit of a look at, uh, of course, you know, you're, you're not supposed to know it's Amazon, but the Duke deal was totally behind the scenes. I think the whole market was surprised. Um, sounds like they went out with Duke and looked at land together. Uh, Duke did secure the land uh, in an area where they wanted it. In this case, it's it kind of fits what you're talking about, it, it, where they're moving out more rural. Uh, it's, twenty, I would say, about 25 miles from downtown. Uh, out on the west side, um, you know, the labor is kind of curious, but they, they must think they can pull people um, out there. But um, in that case, they probably were following incentives from the sound of it. They then have a couple, uh, they have a, uh, at least one prime location I'm aware of, about 90,000 feet, uh, about a 100,000 square foot delivery location that sounds like what's in our facility in Richmond. They had a. Uh, they were setting up a 125,000 square foot Amazon Fresh facility, which incidentally, after the um, Whole Foods purchase, they're now subleasing that. Um, so I don't know if anyone else is seeing that in their markets, but but uh, we're, my understanding is that it is a result of the Whole Foods acquisition that put that on the sublease market. Um, they were looking for. We, there were rumors that Amazon was out looking for four to five hundred thousand square feet. That's been put on hold. Uh, but in general, you know, it sounds like they're. Uh, you'll you'll hear about them looking for kind of the infill sites, hundred thousand square feet plus or minus. All right, great, thank you. I'm just going to keep moving so we mm -hmm. get uh, some color out there. Uh, Brian Blythe. Uh, yeah. So the Amazon's got. Um, a number of different landlords in Charlotte. Uh, they have a 225,000 square foot facility with uh, the Silverman Group out of New Jersey. They have a 500,000 square foot facility with Childers Klein, which is a regional developer. They have a 30,000 square foot uh, facility with a local owner. They have a 170,000 square foot facility with Scannell, and they're finishing up a million square footer with TPA uh, on the north side of Charlotte. Um, and apparently they're going to do another million square footer we've heard rumored uh, in Charlotte, and then also a 500,000 square footer just south of Charlotte in Rock Hill, which will be operated by 3PL, um, but it'll be all Amazon product. Uh, they also have 350,000 square feet with Duke Realty in the Raleigh-Durham market, and they did a million uh, square foot build to suit with Johnson Development in Greenville-Spartanburg. Um, they've had other requirements in Greenville-Spartanburg, but nothing's ever come to fruition. In fact, they looked at a couple of our buildings. Um, and then there's also some uh, rumors floating around that they could be opening a, a, a million, roughly a million square footer in the Greensboro um, market um, sometime in the next 12 to 18 months. So they're, they're, they're still, and there's other requirements that are floating around, but, you know, as, as everyone said, they're always highly confidential and no one ever says it's Amazon. Uh, but you're not working on any, uh, you know, directly yourselves that are out in the market? Not currently, no. Okay. All right, thanks. Uh, uh, Jody Johnston, you're on, and uh, Pete Sheridan, you're on deck. I'm covering all for Florida, so I'll okay. give you the quick update. Um, they've got seven locations in Florida. Six of them are in our markets from Tampa down the, you know, up the I-4 corridor to Orlando and then back to South Florida. Uh, of those six, four were done in the last 18 months. Uh, one in Tampa, one in Lakeland. Uh, are the older ones, and then uh, new in Orlando and Davenport, both are you know 855 and 1.1 million respectively. 
And then South Florida, they did one smaller deal, um, an existing KTR building that got built that was 36 clear at about 350. And then they're doing a build a suit right now on some uh, land with foundry. Most of the deals were sea freed with uh, one Hillwood deal. So just generally, we looked at a deal for our Miami International Trade Port, but it would have been very challenging to make work and really taken us out of the market for the rest of our development projects. So we, we moved on quickly. Great. Thanks, Andy. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Uh, Mike Heisey here on Todd Summerfield on deck. Okay. Uh, the total square footage, uh, well, actually, there was about a million square feet when I got here four years ago. Now there's 8 million square feet in the market. Uh, 3.6 million in the airport area, 2.4 million in North Fort Worth, 494,000 in GSW, and a million four in South Dallas. And uh, there's another, they're looking for another million in the South Dallas, and we were, uh, we're out of the running because we can't bring our product on uh, quickly enough to do that. And it seems like I mean, every time Amazon does a million square footer, there's, a, there's another one pops up on the horizon. So it's we're sort of constantly in the, in the search mode here. So. Uh -huh. And, Mike, are they doing those, you know, you know, with that format where, like, you know, they're, they're not really putting an RFP out there for people to compete with because uh, they're checking out sites that they could bring a Seafried or a Hillwood in to do it for them? Uh, well, the one they're looking in South Dallas are looking for existing buildings and some build, some existing, I mean, some build of suits. But I think, uh, kind of candidly, I think Dallas is getting to the point now where you have to kind of deal with existing developers because there's not a lot of open sites anymore that are sort of not owned by a developer. Or a, Got it. So, and the one, this this one, the recent deal they did with Vantrust, they actually was a 10-year lease, but they have a cancellation at the end of 18 months. But it, but it's they're probably not going to exercise it. Sort of the thought. You know, so. uh, all right, great, thank you. Todd, Steve, Burley, you're on deck. Uh, so they have about a million and a half feet of uh, fulfillment and sortation with Duke uh, at the port of Baltimore. Uh, XPO operates a uh, bulk fulfillment uh, center for them. It's about 600,000 square feet in Aberdeen, and they just opened up a million-footer in Cecil County that uh, Trammel Crow uh, built speculatively. Uh, they're under construction for 850,000 feet for a fulfillment center at Trade Point Atlantic with Hilco. Um, they just signed a lease uh, near BWI for 150,000 square feet, which is a delivery center. They have another delivery center uh, that services uh, sort of Montgomery County and the D.C. Uh, and Goody Drive, which is in, in Rockville. Um, and just a mixed bag of kind of owners there. Um, we do know that, you know, they're always sort of poking around at Washington, D.C., uh, kind of struggling, figuring out how to serve, um, you know, the northern or the northern piece of Washington, D.C. and the, the suburbs. Uh, so we were we have our finger on the pulse with them. We've got a land site that could be primed for them. Um, but that's kind of what we know. And, and we also know that they have space where they're operating with an new logistics provider, LGSTX, uh, at BWI, and they're, they're growing on the, tar the tarmac there. Uh, that's great. And we, did we put that, that land site in front of Amazon? A number of times, yes. Okay, yeah, all right. I uh, thought that sounded familiar. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Steve Rowley, you're up. Matt Newman on deck. Um, all right. So Amazon has approximately 5 million square feet in Atlanta. Um, I think that number is probably higher since there's a couple others that are really covert. But um, it's really I-85 I North uh, with Ackerman, I-75 South. That was what I mentioned where they did the, you know, off-market deal, million square footer with Seafried. Um, they have an I-20 West and an I-85 South. So they, I mean, they've, They've clustered around the entire city. Um, they also announced HQ2 is going to Atlanta, and I think that's about it. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> very funny, very funny. Yeah, they're not going south. All right, uh, Newman up, Adam Bray on deck. All right. Over the last 18 months, we've seen uh, Jim Buff 4.8 million square feet in 2017, about 3 million square feet of activity in 16. Uh, no current requirements that we're tracking in the market. We've seen mostly build-a-suit activity, uh, except for a 400 that Duke did adjacent to uh, some of our Aurora product in Butterfield. Uh, main developers, as we covered already, Seafree, Duke, and Bridge. Bridge did develop a spec solution for them. Uh, existing buildings are build-a-suit, mainly build-a-suit is what we're seeing. And then... Um, and 
uh, build a suit on, on land that the developer controlled or that uh, they identified and then brought in a partner? I think it's been a little bit of both, frankly. Um, okay. But I think for, yeah. go the, ahead. No. The, Duke, the Duke one, the build a suit for Duke was adjacent to the 400,000 square foot spec building they had. So that sort of came hand in hand. The Seafried stuff has been in land they identified together. Um, and then, like in Southeast Wisconsin in 16, they built a million five. That was actually um, uh, with, who was that, Matt? Million five up in KTR. It wasn't KTR, in, Southeast, in Wisconsin, up in Kenosha. Mm -hmm. I'm blank on the developer. Um, but anyway, n n none of sort of the, the big three. So yeah. um, it, it's really been a combination of both, and I think part of that has been a function of timing, right? So they need something quick. There's an existing building or a land set that's controlled. Um, they've jumped on that, so we've seen we've seen more of that than um, sort of the long-term planning. Although, sort of general color, we are definitely seeing that concept of being outside of the major metro to rely on the labor. So they did a million five in southeast Wisconsin, which is sort of the north end. They did a million four in Moni, which is the south end, and then they did a million four uh, out west in Aurora. That again was that Duke reference. So we're definitely seeing that pattern of them doing the, the bigger fulfillment with adjacent sortation um, outside of the primary metro. Got it. Uh, super. Thank you. Um, Adam? Mr. Bray? Did we lose Adam? All right. We're, uh, we're running out of time, so we'll skip over Adam. Uh, uh, Megan is not on the phone, but uh, she had given me uh, some color. She is chasing two sort of 50 to 75,000 square foot requirements uh, on land that uh, that we own or control that's next to a big facility that uh, that they have. They're also rumored to be doing uh, another million square footer in uh, her market. They already have about 4 million square feet uh, there, uh, but she does have active deals that she's working on. She's working with Mandy Moda. Um, and I think Brian Felton, when you speak, you know, I think you're working out with uh, with the same person. Um, uh, and since the Indian Columbus, uh, you know, Kentucky has been sort of a hub for them from the beginning. Uh, you know, it's really Greater Cincinnati. Uh, most of their product was to, you know, was on the northern Kentucky side of uh, of the uh, Mississippi or the Ohio River. Um, uh, but they have done some stuff uh, to the north, you know, in that market. Uh, they have about 5 million square feet in Indianapolis. Uh, they, they took 2 million square footers in Columbus in late, uh, delivered in 17, uh, committed in 16. Uh, you know, they, uh, they, they wanted another million, or they, they've been talking about taking another million square feet in Columbus for a while. Uh, I've talked to them about, you know, what we could potentially do for them. Uh, but we have not had land there, uh, and they're rumored to be about to sign another million square footer with Duke. They did one with Duke on land that Duke controlled. Uh, they did a million. You know, uh, they did another with Prologis on land that Prologis controlled, and this one will be with uh, uh, land that uh, that Duke controlled. Um, wrap it up. Uh, oh, Brian Felton, let me jump to you, uh, and then Justin Fanslow. We'll finish this out. Yeah, I've got. Uh Amazon, Amazon has two 1.2 million square foot uh, fulfillment centers here. Um, they did my building back in uh, 16, the end of 16, um, in uh, late 17, uh, just this past year. Uh, there was a spec building, 320,000 feet going up, which they just leased uh, in its entirety. It's a sortation facility. Um, Panatoni is underway with building two 460,000 foot buildings. It would be curious to see uh, what happens with those. They're going up spec. Uh, wouldn't surprise me if Amazon took one or both of those as well. Uh, that's great. And then uh, Justin, Lehigh Valley. Hey, Jim. Uh, yeah, so in what we'll call Lehigh Valley proper, they've got three buildings, about a million with us over two buildings, and they've got a million one with Duke. Uh, two buildings are sort. One is kind of a hybrid between pick, pack, and bulk. Uh, that's in Lehigh Valley. In Central PA, they've got three buildings. Uh, one is under the XPO, which is the bulk. They've got another kind of pick, pack with us. And then the third. There's two with GLP and one with Prologis. That's right. Two with GLP and one with Prologis. 
Uh, everything they've done has been on spec buildings. I can't, they've not done a build a suit in Lehigh Valley or Central PA. Um, they've got 3PL shopping, their bulk storage uh, operations here now, but no other activity to speak of. Uh, one thing to note, they've come into the market, tried to do the fresh, and they've tried to do a similar operation that they have uh, down in the Richmond area, but have been unsuccessful. And sort of adding to that a theme that we're seeing, Amazon seems to be pushing beyond what we would consider good real estate decisions in terms of they want buildings that are over-improved. They want us to put 3,000 people in a building. They want uh, to run 800 trucks to a building. They want to introduce retail pickup at a building. Things that, you know, just as an owner, you got to worry about zoning. You have to worry about traffic impacts. You have to worry about over-investment in the building. And um, we don't seem to be the only ones resisting. Now, there are some that aren't resisting at all, but it seems like the asset-based and the other REIT owners are, you know, raising their hands saying, hey, we're not comfortable with some of these things that you're asking us to, to do to the, to the asset. Great. And then I, uh, lastly, uh, I don't know if anyone's on from Philly, but that you were chasing a Philly was chasing a couple of, of opportunities with them. I don't know if they're still active. I don't know if anyone from Philly's on. Hey, Jim, this is Massey. Can I just jump one quick thing? I know we're going to wrap it up. I think it's worth Ben O'Neill had to jump, but I think it's we'll follow back up on this. But he's in the middle of a, pr a very interesting data driven project. You know, he has an interest, obviously, in those in that geocoding type work. But he's cataloged all the Amazon facilities throughout the U.S., including the, where they're located, the square footage of each, and the type of the facility. And he started to think about how to leverage the information, but he has the ability to overlay those buildings in our markets you know, relative to where our assets are. And just more to, more to come on that, but I want everybody to be aware that Ben can get you that information quickly if, if you just want to, as a baseline, understand locations and we're hoping to be able to understand the use of the facilities and, and maybe how to think about not that we're going to outsmart Amazon in our next step but we'll, we'll we'll follow up on that and hopefully something good will fall out of that with you know, us being smarter with, with staying ahead of them uh, hey Jim yeah. Jim it's Pete Corker I just want to comment real quick on the two deals that that Megan is chasing in Phoenix because I'm chasing a similar deal we're negotiating, we'll go, go to leases on it, a similar deal on South Jersey. They're smaller, and they're in the 50 to 70,000 square foot range. And what Amazon's going to do is they're going to, they're going to pick two locations within 10 miles of each other, and they're going to share resources between people and equipment between the two. But the other, the neat thing is that these are considered add-ons product. So if you order something from Amazon, and then there's a smaller item that you can only get if you if you purchase this, you, the smaller item item. That's what they're going to be handling these in these smaller facilities. So they're going to put open up two of them down in, in South Jersey, and I know that Megan has an opportunity to make both deals out in the Phoenix market. And it also includes, to some extent, van service and maybe bringing the trucks into the, the buildings, which is uh, you know similar to what, not quite like Brian talked about, but the same idea. Uh, excellent. All right, I'm going to wrap it up. That this slide presentation will be on the portal. I also will include um, uh, a paper from Deutsche Bank that uh, Mr. Alderman turned me on to. Uh, a website that uh, uh, you know tracks uh, a lot of Amazon stuff, and um, and I I will put a copy of the letter to the shareholders from Be Bezos for the first, fifth, fifteenth, twentieth and most recent uh, years of their existence. He's a pretty bright guy, and I think they're, uh, they're actually good reads as far as, far as the philosophy goes. Uh, that's it. Thanks for listening. Uh, you can email me if you have questions, and uh, if I got an answer, I'm happy to provide it. Have a great afternoon.